Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to call this meeting of the Juvenile Detention Board of Managers to order. First item of business, as always, is uh, a Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next item, as always, is our first round of public comments. Um, as always, we have public comment at the beginning and the end of our meeting. The public comments at the beginning um, must be kept to items that are specifically on the agenda for today. For anyone like uh, wishing to speak, please limit your comments to five minutes, and please give your name uh, and your address at the outset of your comments. Is there anyone from the public who would like to speak today? Right, hearing none. Next item is an approval of the January 18th minutes. I move we approve the minutes of the January 18th, 2022 meeting. Second. Motion and a second. Any questions or comments on the minutes before we vote? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And is there a, an abstention perhaps from someone who wasn't here? That would be me. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you, Marie. Um, Next item is an introduction to uh, for our newest member of the board, Mr. James E. Turner, uh, has been appointed as one of the uh, president judges' three appointments to a term um, commencing um, this this month. Mr. Turner, I don't know if you'd like to just speak briefly about your your background and what brought you to the board. So, uh, so briefly, I'm never. Um, Never brief, but uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, Judge Nichols brought me to the board. I'm very excited to be here. Um, by way of background, I live in the city of Chester. Um, I'm a former director of economic development and uh, currently uh, do uh, community and develop, uh, economic development. And I'm also a minister in, um, in Chester. So I'm uh, very excited about being a part of, uh, of the great move and reshaping of uh, this organization. Next item for today is a report from our superintendent, Mr. Rizzeri. Um, Dave, the floor is yours. Sure. All right, well, thank you. Today is a day, I think, um, you know, essentially my first month on the job. Really wanted to put together a strategy of, of what we can accomplish together within our first year. It'd be a combination of, uh, you know, what I was told was under my umbrella it was the reform of detention, as well as uh, developing a comprehensive menu for the young people in the county. Uh, so I'll kind of roll it out in stages. Uh, stage one, two, and three are uh, have to happen uh, essentially consecutively. Uh, stage four is a, is a continuous process in which you know it'll make more sense as we go through this. All right, so uh, I always like to start with a quote. Our, our county executive director is a big fan of quotes. I like to include these in, in, in our presentations. But uh, stage one essentially um, is that baseline data collection and evaluation of what we currently have. Uh, one saying that I'm a fan of is if you can't measure it, uh, you're not able to approve it. Sean, this is freezing. OK. All right, so some key action items that need to happen in order for stage one of our strategy uh, to be successful. Um, we really like to utilize the public health approach uh, to collect, analyze, and evaluate data that we currently have in the county. Uh, some suggestions for me um, need some data in terms of the frequency, uh, times of day, times of day the dates, locations where juvenile arrests are happening most frequently here in the county. I'd like to break it down between our 12 to 17 year olds and our 18 to 20 year, 21 year olds. More data um, that I would like to collect is just where 
offenders are residing in their county. I think this is relevant because it's not it's it's not common, but if we see that arrests are happening in one one area of the county and they're residing in, in a separate area, um, part of our inter intervention could be some things as area restriction, things of that nature, but it could show that folks are traveling to certain parts of the county in order uh, to be engaged in delinquency. Uh, some some of the basic demographics, right? The gender, the race. We want to we want to know overall who's affected the most here in the county by juvenile delinquency. What young people are being arrested most, uh, and then really be able to put that together in a heat map for in a format. That visual shows us um, again when, where, day, time, uh, where they're living, what demographics most effective, all in one format. Um, it's able to help us uh, make informed decisions. Second part of the strategy, um, we want to conduct a comprehensive assessment of what we currently fund, right? What interventions, what models, what strategies, what policies we currently have, uh, and how effective they are. Um, that's just common sense. I think we need to know what we have and if it's working. And the third, you know, the third part of stage one is looking, I'm looking to develop a tool, right? Survey of 500 plus criminal justice involved youth pretty much getting their perspective, their perspective on what they need uh, in order to successfully be rehabilitating their community, what they need to stay alive and thrive within their community, and pretty much um, maybe their factors on um, why their peers are engaged in delinquent behavior. I think uh, anything we build here, and we have a table here uh, full of established professionals, one thing we don't have is young people. I think we have to include their voices. Again, being able to analyze that uh, and include it in our uh, informed decision-making process, which is stage two. Well, when we talk about our goals of stage one, right, particularly we just want to gain a baseline. Uh, on one side, we want to know what we have, what's working, uh, what may, ne may need improvement and how much we're paying for that. Um, we also want to make sure that in this process that this is, this, there's an effort to acknowledge and empower folks who are already doing good work in the community um, and identify that, right? We also want to gain an understanding of some of the basics, where, where and when delinquency is happening the most, what times of the day. Uh, that's all important to make sure that we align all our interventions um, with the data showing us. A little bit of freeze over here. Apologize. Okay, I'm back here. All right, so what are some key things that need to happen in order for stage one to be successful, right? Number one, we have to contract with a, a research provider to really be able to collect that data from uh, continuous departments, um, collect information, analyze it, uh, bring it back to the team. Um, obviously, we need buy-in from all, all departments, right? So uh, we're going to be uh, looking at court information, district attorney, public defender, et cetera. Uh, we need you know, these people at the table to understand this is an inclusive uh, process. We need them at the table. Um, their partnership is key here. Um, and again, leadership's commitment to say, hey, what, what isn't working, we need to take another look at. Um, oftentimes, it may be saying it's ineffective. We may need to end that contract, or we may require them to develop an, a corrective action plan. Um, but again, folks at the table saying, hey, this isn't working based off the information we receive. We need to uh, recommit. Um, and then again, you know, Maybe historically, certain departments aren't sharing information. Uh, collectively, us saying that, hey, we're, we're going to break down those barriers, we're going to work together, and uh, we want to be successful. So what it looks like, or what it could look like, um, I talked about some data points I was interested in. Um, I think when we look at our partners with courts and probation, um, we can really use some of their internal information to provide a historical analysis of what criminal just uh, some, some young people who have come through their doors uh, under, better understanding of uh, their demographic profile, and again, you know, using that information to see if there's been any changes over time. Uh, using DHS, again, our partners at the courts and the budget office, uh, to have access to what we are currently funding in terms of youth services. Again, we don't have to look exclusively to, to uh, criminal justice involved youth at, at this point. We just want to see what we have, um, and again, doing a budget analysis. Are we paying for it, uh, what we're paying for it, and, uh, you know, are we uh, being effective. We have our partners at District Attorney and Public Defender. They have data that may provide us with, again, uh, analysis of young people from different vantage points. It's important to include them, include them. And again, we're talking about including young people, uh, getting, you know, 
serving them, getting their needs, serving their experiences, and um, pretty much empowering their voice throughout the process. So how do, how do we operationalize stage one? Uh, again, it's, it's my idea to develop an internal data task force. All the relevant partners, juvenile probation, courts, district attorney, public offender, even some community-based organizations um, are, will be a part of this task force. Moving on to the sec uh, second stage uh, of their operation, uh, collectively, we develop what research questions and what data requests we need in order to come up with it, you know, what the problem statement is, is here in Delaware County as it relates to young people. Uh, third stage is you know, this evaluator that we uh, bring aboard or research uh, uh, organization has this, collects the information. Uh, folks on the task force, um, I, I guess, serve as uh, the gatekeepers to their particular agency. So if uh, our chief, Di Matteo, is representing juvenile probation, she's uh, making sure that any uh, data requests in terms of juvenile probation uh, are easily accessed and, and given to our evaluator in order so we can collect them and evaluate them. And then we'll essentially we'll have, this, we'll have this document that gives us all the information we need that we've decided as a team we need. Um, it's available to all partners at the table. Uh, hopefully other partners are using it to inform any strategies they're developing. But it gives us a problem, it gives us a problem statement and pretty much outlines uh, where we are, you know, where we'll be going with stage two. I just, I just really want to outline that stage one, um, there is no recommendations in stage one, right? It's just give us the data, let's compile it, let's analyze it, and let the data tell the story. At that point, uh, we'll move on to stage two. But before we do that, in terms of stage one, does uh, anybody have any questions? So, um, okay. sorry. no, so I, I guess my first question or observation sure. would be one, and um, please, I have a way of probably messing with people's stuff, so I'm going to try not to, but I probably will. So have you done an analysis of or a modeling of the current structure internally of how all the departments are working together to get to have maximum outcome? Because if you're, if you're doing a baseline of the young people and the system is still the same and the system isn't working, then you're going to have the same outcome. Sure. So I'm just wondering if there, if that's either part of your process or if that's in your jurisdiction to do in order to be able to actually know that the team is working well and therefore the outcome is working well. So the process is working well both for internally and externally as the young people are coming into your system. So I think my answer to that would be if, if there is any potential lapse in the system or a system needs to be created, the lack of data would show that, right? So I think as we move into when I'll talk about stage two and coming up with recommendations based off the data, I think that's when collectively we'll come together and develop what the strategy is based off the information or the lack of information. Okay. So it sounded, it sounded like the part of that stage one, it's collection of the data sure. and um, sort of reporting, but also evaluation of quality. And I'm just wondering how that happens other than the youth survey, which I, I guess would give you that. Sure. So it would, it would ultimately have to be a complete collaborative approach, right? We would need uh, the Department of Human Services who have programs geared toward young people, uh, our courts who have uh, programs geared to young people, pretty much buying in and, and allowing our, eva our research evaluator to come in, uh, look at what they have, uh, look at what outcomes they have, and at that point, um, it would be a baseline of what we what we currently have, right? This is this is what services in terms of mental health, what services in terms of X, Y, and Z, and at that point, uh, based off the data. So l let me just give you an example, right? The data shows us that young people in this county are more likely to be arrested between four and eight o'clock, right? Uh, predominant you know predominant juveniles are residing in Chester County, Pennsylvania, right? And we're looking at our current programs and we're saying that. Most of them uh, aren't after hours, aren't geared toward after, out of school time, or uh, aren't, uh, I guess, specific to Chester, right? It's open to anybody in the county, right? Um, one recommendation, again, this is not a recommendation stage. It's just given, it's just given the information. One, rec one recommendation of the team could be, uh, this is an effective program, but it doesn't best service uh, our area of concern here. And you know, we, can, we can hopefully switch or we can you know, come together and say, hey, collectively, uh, 
you know, we need some change here. But I guess my question is, is this evaluator going to make um, assessments of the quality of the programs that were offered? No, because I would say at, at one point in time, I think we can, I think it's just given, telling us what we have, mm -hmm. what data information in terms of their outcomes they have read, uh, readily available. I understand to do a real comprehensive uh, evaluation of a program, that's time consuming, mm -hmm. right? You don't want to spend too much time on the data collection aspect of it because a lot of places, not just here, jurisdictions, may not have all the information you need. And we can, we can I guess, twirl our thumbs around making sure we get everything. And, and I, would, I would argue that let's get what we have, whatever story that tells. Collectively, we can say moving forward, day four, this is the type of information we want to collect. As long as everybody's agreeing to that, uh, you know, we'll have something more comprehensive next calendar year. Um, but we, I can essentially spend a year on data collection, right? Uh, but again, you know, we have an issue here in the county or a concern here in the county where uh, we, need, uh, we need to move, uh, I think, responsibly, but we need to move rapid. What, what is the timing that you would anticipate for this? Sure. But there, there is a slide on the timeline. Yeah, I know. I'm, just, I'm jumped. I, I, I read them, so I'll, I'll wait so. then. I'm just, you asked for questions at this time. So yeah, I'll, yeah. Um, um, I'll, I'll, reserve, I'll save my questions and until later then. Okay. That's okay. Yep. Ms. Townsend? Can you hear us? Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Yep. Okay. Thank you for acknowledging my hand raise. One of the questions that I have was, um, you, when you outlined the different stages of activity, um, I didn't hear um, or see the role that you anticipate the board playing in this process that, as it goes out. So like as the, as the charge of the data collection group, what's the inputs or how, how do you foresee the board supporting um, this work, if at all? Uh, mo most of the heavy lift from the board will be stage two. Uh, bringing in an evaluator just to collect it and analyze it. If there's somebody on the board who likes likes the data aspect of it, for sure, uh, you're more than welcome to assist. Um, but again, I think at the it's important to know at the end of this, at the end of stage one, there's going to be a document or a report, and that's going to be presented to the board in this meeting by our evaluator. I would just also have a general answer, which is that board members can feel free to be as involved as they choose to in any part of whatever we're doing here. And so, you know, any board member should feel free to, you know, correspond directly with our superintendent as he uh, as he leads this. And I, I also add, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Ms. Townsend, but uh, hopefully this is this is a contract that's going to be RFP. So I would need the board's assistant assistance in terms of I, you know. We've got our top three or top two candidates to help me select who's best to take on this process. You answered my question. I was trying to understand our authority in this space and what kinds of decisions we would be making. And I think, um, you know, the selection of the right vendor, the, the, the right sizing of the scope. I mean, I, I can imagine there would be point opportunities for us to give feedback as you move forward without directly doing the work, right? And so that's what I was trying to get a sense of in stage one where those points were. Um, so thank you. No worries. So uh, could you tell us a little bit in broad strokes what kind of vendor, tell us a little bit about the RFP. Who are you looking for? What's the skill set? Um, and what are, what are their outputs? Sure. So I think in terms of the skill set, I mean, heavily on the research uh, background and evaluating juvenile justice programming, um, I don't want to state what vendors have the capability to do this. I mean, in, in my former role, I've used vendors such as AIR, America's Institute for Research. We use Temple University. We use UPenn. Um, again, I think in terms of the scope, we have to just outline exactly what we're looking for, right? We need somebody to, to come in um, to, uh, I guess, give a baseline evaluation of what we currently have, what are the menu of services, um, and again, work with all the departments around what data they currently collect in, in terms of juvenile justice and be able to analyze that in one central <coughs> location. Any other questions from the board? Okay. Um, yeah, just one, there's like, so do, do you have a 
So you, you're collecting a baseline, but are you you have something that you're applying it against uh, a best practice somewhere else or something like that? So how do you know how will you know if what you have here is sufficient to meet the goals that you are putting in place? Yeah, I think we'll we'll talk a little bit about what 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 a uh, you know our logic model is and what we're working toward. I mean, ultimately, we're working toward uh, the reduction of delinquency here in the county, reduction of juvenile uh, um, arrest, you know, things of that nature. Um, but I think, we, we, again, you know, how we go about that is really, in, in, you know, with the help of the board, right? What, what, what is the yearly goal we want? We, we measure is it a 10 percent? And over five years, we want to see 50 percent a reduction, things of that nature. I think the technicality of that, you know, I'm really leaning on the board uh, uh, to uh, provide what we all want to accomplish. Okay. I mean, we can we can we can compare the numbers to national. Or we can compare it to a surrounding county whose population is, is similar. We can get as creative as possible. Include that in the scope as well. Any other questions in terms of stage one? I might come back to one. Okay. No worries. <laughs> so uh, as so as we as we have uh, my hopes to what this comprehensive data is and it's telling the story in terms of young people here in the county. Uh, stage two is, again, and it's really the theme of this presentation is collaboration. Again, uh, just a little quote, we can't accomplish all that we uh, need to do without working together. So uh, essentially, we, 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 have this, we have a plethora worth of data here. Um, and key action items to stage two is, uh, number one, I thought it, was, it, it would be great to invite some of these national, statewide uh, TTA providers, right? And essentially what they're doing for us is they're helping guide our recommendations really based off of evidence-based strategies on now that we have what the problem statement is here, right? What interventions nationwide best, uh, uh, best complement that, right? So again, if we're, and I'll give you another example. If, if they're showing that young people in the county are being arrested uh, between 4 and 8 p.m., Right, one, one evidence-based strategy is an even reporting center, right? Even reporting center that operates during those times. They're able to have some structured programming within that time. Uh, and again, collectively, uh, looking for this TTA provider to come in, say, hey, this is, this is, th these are some options that have worked nationally, have worked historically throughout the nation, relying on the board to say, hey, you know, and then having a cost associated with it, relying on the board to say, hey, uh, we like this. We want to invest it. We want to see what a pilot program looks like. Uh, you know, after this presentation, I'm hoping to have presentations throughout the year of uh, folks that I've talked to um, that fit my vision and, and bring it to the board and collectively hoping you all uh, want to buy in. Um, again, uh, I think it is important to have youth voice uh, at the door uh, and throughout looking to create uh, a youth advisory board um, for the strategy as well. Again, just want to run it by young people who are, you know, who, who are young and, and, and know what their peers want and need um, and be able to utilize them as well. And again, the uh, theme of this presentation is making sure everybody, uh, all the relevant county stakeholders are, are, are here throughout the process at the table um, and are agreeable to what we're trying to do here. We talk about the goals here. Again, bringing in some of these national experts, we want to gain national ex, uh, expertise on what are national best practices uh, and, and, and really want to connect to some of the local leadership and, and uh, national resources. Uh, I really would like to establish this external community advisory. Uh, this is young, with young people. The way it essentially could look like is we have, uh, again, we have all this data showing that there, these are the areas concerned. Using this youth advisory board, as long, along with this board, um, to develop recommendations on how we're going to engage young people and use best practices while doing it. Um, and with the collaboration piece, I really would like to break down the silos and really develop internal systems that include uh, all of our local agencies working together toward, toward something uh, greater than us. What we need in order to pull this off, some key contributors. Uh, again, making sure that our decision-making process is inclusive. 
We want all folks, folks at the table to understand what we're doing and to buy in what we're doing uh, and, uh, you know, work together. Uh, again, as we bring folks to the table um, who present out as a group identifying who fits, you know, our best long-term vision and just making sure strategically we're including young people in our decision-making process. In terms of stage two, um, do we have any questions? So ultimately, uh, evaluator comes in, data set, gives us, a, you know, gives us our, our area of concern. National providers come in at that point, help us make decisions around what we should do. Could you, could you talk a little bit more about your youth and community engagement strategy? Sure, again, so as we develop things, and it could be, hey, you know, present to them, this is the current, me current men menu of services, getting their feedback on it. Um, as we have, at this point, we should have 500 plus young people surveyed who have been through the criminal justice system, and they're telling us this is what we need in order to be, you know, to stay alive and thrive within these communities, right? That's presented to them, and they're pretty much the voice of, of these young people, if you, you know, whatever it is. If we surveyed 500 young people and they're saying, hey, we want uh, a uh, mentorship basketball program, right? Uh, young people at the table making sure that happens, being the voice saying, hey, you know, back in April we collected the survey and these are the things that young people in the county said they wanted. They're pretty much holding us to the fire that making sure it gets done. Um, hopefully they can attend these meetings and as presentations on potential uh, programs in the county, they can give their feedback uh, from their perspective as well. Uh, I think that's important. <clears throat> and we can get creative in terms of how we use them, right? This entity is here. Uh, I think collectively we, we can be creative on how we want them used, but they ultimately have to be at the table. We're making decisions around young people in their lives, and unfortunately, they're, you know, at this point, they're not at the table. I just think, uh, uh, you know, it isn't going to work. So I, I know you've probably been involved in efforts in uh, Philadelphia that include having young people at decision-making tables, yep. not just consultative tables. Sure. Um, do you have any plans to do that? And, and if so, uh, talk to us a little bit about what that might look like. So not just inviting 500 young people to have pizza and tell us how we failed them, sure. but having them uh, a part of conversations like this one, I think, could be um, really useful. So I wondered if you'd given any thought to that and what it might look like. Yeah, I mean, essentially, for it being an advisory board, I mean, they will be working for decisions, right? And again, you know, my thoughts initially as we think about investing in new <coughs> programs, having them at the table to say, this works, uh, this is something that I would buy into, um, again, I think is important. Yeah. And pizza always helps, right? We, 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 pizza we always them. helps. Yeah, we need them here, and we got to feed them. I, I don't, I've never heard the term TTA. Technical. Is that a term of art within this industry, or is that just a, like yes. can you give an example of one of those organizations? Uh, so the two that I've met with, number one, uh, through the uh, Ann uh, Casey Foundation, they recommend, recommended a program uh, organization called uh, Children's Centers for, I think, Law and Policy out in D.C., right? They work with municipalities and cities throughout the nation who are doing what we're trying to do, right? Have a lot of, have a lot of data and outcomes in terms of they've been <coughs> in the cities and they've done this and this is some change that they had. Um, another organization recommended by Juvenile, uh, the judges, juvenile, JCJC is juvenile, juvenile court judges commission. Right. <laughs> uh, they recommend an organization called, uh, I think, the Center for State Govern Governments or things of that nature. So, they come in um, think tanks, but you know they have, I guess, the data and outcomes to show they've done it in other places. Uh -huh. Technical assistance. So it's not, I mean, they're thinkers, but they're also like the doers alongside and training. And, and it's in, in many fields. Yep. So mm -hmm. like me right. healthcare, medical, yep. any, any type of field. Someone, some, it's more like a consultation, mm -hmm. consultants. So I just wanted to make sure I'm following correctly. Sure. So I guess would there then be two RFP processes for this? There would be one for the data analysis and then one for the TTA. Aspect of not it. necessarily. A lot of organizations I spoke with can do both, but I, I would I would recommend that you know, uh, in terms of the timeline, we want to make sure that whatever uh, you know, 
fits within our timeline. But I'm not opposed to uh, any organization that, that has a data component. Most of the organizations I've spoke to um, within their contract, within their monies that we allocate to them, are going to hire a research a university to do the, the data aspect of it anyway. So we have an option to choose our own, or you know, if they have a list of providers that they use, University of Maine is one that I've heard. Uh, you know, it's all receptive to the board and how how we want to best go about it. I'm I'm more interested in the end result, um, but I'm willing to bring everybody to the table and give multiple options, what's most cost effective, et cetera. So perhaps it might make sense to RFP both elements of those together. And if someone would like to bid on one or the other or both, they can do so. Sure. And that way we can really be taking this process on more holistically. Thinking, sure. You know, and not just sequentially, but the mm -hmm. whole thing. Sure. I agree. Any other questions in terms of uh, stage two? Not, we'll move on. This isn't paused. Stage three, essentially we're, we're at that point uh, where we have the data, uh, we have uh, you know, this, this help here that pretty much told us how we can invest uh, in innovative ways um, uh, in terms of programming. And I, think, and, and I think stage three underlines the how, right? We're ready to invest in new and in, in innovative evidence-based programming. How do we do that? Again, a quote, only way to improve is to try new things. So some key action items. I'm hoping that and two and three are going to really fall under the same uh, technical assistance or provider, but help us develop the roadmap, right, for how, you know, based off the of recommendations that we created in uh, section two, how we're going to go about implementing them, right? And I, I've talked about throughout this process, making sure that other municipalities, other jurisdictions, other programmers are here to present out what they're doing, making sure the board, you know, the board, the board is aware of that. And uh, at that point, you know, we can, we can lay out what we want to do and how we want to do it. Essentially, with this stage, we're, we're just talking about increasing quality services to young people. I've listed some ways to go about it. Again, you know, really relying on the board and, and, and our team. Uh, of partners to uh, come up with what that menu looks like. Um, but one thing I talked about um, was focusing on the prevention aspect of it. Uh, sometimes uh, I'm a fan of offense over defense. So, you know, when young kids are walking through our doors, at one point we, you know, we almost lost one, one aspect of the battle, right? Really looking at the day that we have in stage one uh, and try to come up with some, some risk factors and some preventative measures to make sure that, that they do not come to the door. For the young people who do, um, again, we, we, stage one is going to identify, we may, may or may not already have some of these programs, but you know, make sure we're over-utilizing diversion, community-level interventions. I talked about even important centers. I talked about unknown detentions, uh, making sure that you know, we have that and we're utilizing it. Um, make sure we're, we're incorporating a lot of the CBI, which is cognitive behavior intervention, and anything around mental health and, my, and, and mindset development is important in terms of our programming. Uh, really, we like to look at different workforce development strategies, particularly for some of the older youth, 18 to 21. Uh, you know, our Chief D. Mateo talked about that being a, 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 a different group because there's a lot of out-of-school time. Um, and then utilizing uh, community partnerships, uh, credible messenger models, really to provide that high-level one-on-one mentoring component, right, to, to either new or existing programming. In terms of three, uh, prioritizing uh, highest risk youth um, who are harmed to themselves or others. I think one thing we have to do, preferably in stage one, is all our law enforcement partners, including public defender, um, come together and identify, right, who, is, who, who are the high risk youth? What, what's that profile? Who, uh, who is he or her, right? Is it, is it just based off of their offenses? Is it, is it based off a combination of offenses? Uh, their, their, the areas they live or are violent, um, who they associate with. I think collectively we have to decide who that is and then come up with a plan to intervene. <clears throat> and then for those who are confined, coming up with uh, uh, ways of improving their services. At, at some point in time, uh, we don't know when, we don't have control over when, but they're going to be released back into the community. So we have to make sure that when we have 
uh, that time that um, you know we are doing our best uh, to start engaging in them then you know we're talking about sophisticated home plans um, I, I know our partners at the court will also do something very similar um, starting in the center maybe transition a draft of that document to the courts so they can continue to build off of that but everybody's talking we know uh, we you know we know what he or she wants to do we can report that um, to whoever their community supervision uh, agency is and at that point continue to build with it make sure there's a lot of uh, mental wellness programs within the center self esteem conflict resolution uh, just make sure there's comprehensive programs uh, for young people as they're detained uh, to start that engagement process I think for stage three it's simple number one is uh, as we see things we like and we want to invest in them having funding really readily available uh, and two is again the theme of this is collaboration we need law enforcement we need community-based organizations we need our local government leaders uh, faith leaders uh, and, uh, and most importantly the community that's most effective in terms of stage three do we uh, have any questions or comments hearing none I'll, I'll move on and stage four and it's 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 loosely labeled stage four uh, because this is this is a conversation that we have to have throughout this process starting yesterday all right so what it, you know you know what is what is our detention going to look like essentially right and I'm, I'm really uh, big on in terms of labeling right we're calling a youth rehabilitation center a lot of folks in our surrounding counties counties call them youth centers call them uh, rehabilitation centers but we have to be careful of what we're calling it um, I said early on right if we treat young people like uh, convicts and criminals uh, the likelihood that they're going to act that way is, 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 a, is a lot more um, so again aiming for the stars with this piece and I use the quote high expectations are the key to everything uh, so the key action item from here is we just want to establish a physical space right we know that only the highest risk young people need this type of intervention um, so having a space for them to, to go there and receive quality interventions uh, is important to me uh, in terms of our goals uh, we have to establish what our long you know what our best long-term option is here in the county right is it partnering with a local uh, existing center is it establishing a new space for for young people or is it renovating a space uh, that we've, we've used in the past all right, we talk about our we, we, we talk about our goals and the second goal here is just whatever we invest in we have to make sure that it's safe supportive to young people their families and the staff that work there we have to lead with values we have to maintain a safe environment we have to really uh, develop the staff there right invest in them in terms of being able to uh, establish positive and supportive relationships with anybody who walks through the door because relationships are key right if a young person uh, you know has a relationship with you you know they'll run through a wall for you if, if they believe in you uh, provide a bunch of different programs what we talked about treat family members of these young people as partners it means having them at the table um, and making sure that you know they're getting what they need as well encouraging the community to come into these centers uh, and again continuous quality improvement right it isn't it isn't at the end of the year we're going to look at it right whether it's quarterly whether it's weekly looking at what we're doing making sure it's working and making sure it's going toward where we want to be uh, a lot like three you know this stage is having you know once we have our plan uh, having funding uh, readily available to pull it off and again with everything else throughout this process making sure all partners are at the table uh, they have buy-in and uh, it was an inclusive process Any, any questions or comments in terms of three? Just a, a comment. Um, sure. First, just thanking you for putting together such a comprehensive plan. Um, it's a lot of work for a month <laughs> on the job, so thank you for doing that. Oh, you're welcome. Um, and also, why is your stage four not stage one? Yeah. Given that I'm playing devil's advocate. Sure. But <laughs> why, why is your stage four not the very first thing um, that you're focusing on if you could share with us a little bit of your thinking about well I just want to clarify right stage that. stage four is the long-term plan so in terms of in terms of finding a short-term solution uh, that is that essentially is my stage one right we have to make sure that we have something in place 
um, in the interim that allows us collectively to come together and develop what the future is. All right, so I just want to clarify that. But in terms of the long term, um, uh, you know, I, I, I just think as we invest in the alternatives, as we invest in the community, as we invest in some of these community-based organizations, the likelihood that we're going to uh, need a traditional center, uh, I believe, uh, may decrease. Um, until we get to that, there, you know, there, we have miles to get to that point, right? But I think if we have a comprehensive menu of alternatives, um, we're showing and proving that they've been affected in other jurisdictions, it allows us to make an informed decision on how to best go about four, right? Um, we're in negotiation now with, with neighboring counties, right? That may be a long-term solution. Uh, but again, I just want to clarify, right? The short-term piece is the top of my list. It really is. We have to find something, but uh, we need the time to collectively come together and understand what the long-term is. And I think um, having a stage four allows us to do so. So, so to clarify, stages one through three are not making the case that we don't need some form of detention. Sure. Right. And and uh, yeah, I thought I you know, and I'll, I'll repeat it. Right. One, two, and three are consecutive. They're labeled stages because they are consecutive. Four is four is a planning process and conversation that we need to be having from day one, um, and it's throughout. <coughs> and I, I, I've prepared a timeline that talks about kind of where we need to have a decision, have to have a decision made in terms of what our long term is. Uh, but again, yeah, I don't want to give the impression that, you know, we put all these things in place and then we start talking about it. I think the conversation has to happen throughout. Um, but again, uh, you know, other things we invest in are going to support uh, what the long term could be. Yeah, what I hear you saying is there is a need for detention throughout the process. There's a need for detention right now. Yes. And there continues to be throughout this process. Yes. Um, but what stages one through three do is they allow for a further revealing for us of what the ultimate uh, format looks like sure. for detention, that sure. we perhaps take that ongoing detention that exists and we, you know, revise it, so to speak, as we learn more throughout this this process. Yes. And I, just, just for the public to understand, you know, whatever, whatever option we choose in terms of the long term cannot happen tomorrow, right? There's going to be a lot of, uh, there can be a lot of idle time between either redeveloping something, building out something that already exists. In the meantime, we can focus on the alternatives. Uh, and when a comprehensive plan is together, I think we'll, you know, we'll be in a good, we'll be in a good place. I'm curious if you, um, I mean, are you starting from scratch here? Did you, have you come across prior studies or introspection in the county on all of these programs? Has there been, has this happened before? Uh, so uh, in terms of this strategy? No, in terms of assessing what is a, the menu sure. of the alternatives for sure. our children in crisis. Yeah, I think in my last row, we implement a very similar process, right? We started off with, uh, and I worked in homicide and shooting uh, reduction in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, but, you know, after shootings and violence picked up, our mayor tasked us to come up with a plan and really only gave us 100 days to come up with it. There was a lot of infrastructure in place, so they, there was already a central location, which is known as a DIVIC that houses all the criminal justice information. So that wasn't really an obstacle. Uh, but again, uh, yeah, our data showed that, you know, black males between the ages of uh, 16 and 34 will most likely be shot and killed in the city, so we made sure that uh, every department had interventions uh, that were structured toward that. We looked at where and when shootings were happening most and made sure all our programs aligned within that. Uh, and, and again, I mean, there was departments that felt like we have no wrong violence prevention. Think of the streets department, right? They're like, we have nothing, but we saw that data showed us a lot of blocks where shootings were happening were extremely dark. Right, so streets come in, you know, when a shooting happens, we need you to put up LED lights and light this whole block up, things of that nature. So, yeah, it, you know, I've been part of that process. Um, and again, a lot of these national technical uh, assistance and training providers are going to have a lot of historical uh, background and evidence in coming in different municipalities. Um, a lot of them are used to working on the state level, but have worked with counties as well. And uh, they'll have, a, you know, they'll, they'll be able to provide a lot of information in terms of how it's been successful. Yeah, actually, I was going to su suggest maybe that uh, 
and maybe you've already done this, but I know the PCCD, Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency, has spent a humongous amount of money sure. on juvenile justice and research through Penn State, through the Epcot Center and things sure. like that. So, and they've done a lot of work. I know there are communities like Aliquippa, York, um, and some other places that they have done, they've, they've gone through this process, sure. done some um, retooling of their system. So, like you said, so Lancaster, for instance, as a perfect example, they sure. looked at their data and they said, okay, let's have day, you know, let's have reporting centers at this particular time. And yep. they greatly reduced sure. programs. And then, you know, let's have job training in that center, not at 10 o'clock in the morning or at 8 o'clock in the morning, but have it at 4 o'clock in the afternoon because that's when young people are actually up and active, sure. those type of things. So sure. I think, I mean, if you haven't already, I mean, I'm sure you have, but if you haven't, then having a conversation with the folks at PCCD would probably be very helpful yeah. to give you some base line of some of the things that are possible here yeah. in the state. So. Yeah, I agree. And I think most cities that have went through a reform uh, in terms of many subjects have just used data to inform the decisions. And again, I, I, I think the, you know, the potential partners that are going to come to the table are going to have a lot of historic, right? And I wouldn't be surprised if uh, anybody who we present out to the board has worked with some of these municipalities in the state of Pennsylvania as well. Okay, any other questions in terms of uh, four? All right, so what are we trying to accomplish here by uh, December 31st? Uh, first and foremost, very, number one, and I want to be clear on it, right? We, I, I really want to establish the temporary space and have a long-term plan for uh, young people who need, to, who need the in, in, intervention of confinement, right? That's, that's top of my list. Uh, we're working through a lot of the temporary space of it. Um, with two, three, and four, um, you know, some strategies, uh, I think we don't really have to wait for the data to come in and, and show us that, you know, uh, we need to approach this. These are some strategies that essentially work anywhere you put them, and, and I think a lot of criminal justice leaders uh, will support that. And uh, looking to try to partner with a community-based organization to pilot um, one ERC, formerly known as Evening Reporting Center, I like to call them Evening Resource Centers, right, operating between four and eight. I think nationally that shows where delinquency is happening the most. Um, again, hopefully our data supports that as well. Uh, within that center, have an educational support forum, lies young people are still in school, so make sure they have support in order to uh, a lot, you know, thrive in school. Uh, CBI, some sort of intervention, some recreational activities, and then a mentorship component. So what it, you know, what it could look like is, uh, eight to four, you're in school. Four to eight, you're in this center um, uh, receiving more support. Uh, definitely want to partner with a community-based organization um, to uh, utilize the credible messenger model, uh, providing one-on-one -on -one support uh, to young people and their family. Again, many jurisdictions have used it. It's been effective. They can be used in many different ways. Um, and then four, uh, want to expand or develop two transitional job, job programs for uh, young people. Um, so what, what I say too is, again, I, you know, something geared toward, and I, I really am a fan of the restorative justice approach, so maybe two days in the classroom where you're getting your traditional job readiness uh, um, curriculum, and then three out in the field where you're getting uh, real-time work experience, anything around uh, cleaning and greening the, the, the communities that they reside in, you know, some folks may say at one point in time they were part of terrorizing their community, um, using a restorative justice model um, to now help them come back and rehabilitate their community, I think is big. It's a lot of evidence that shows that that works. Um, and then for that school age group, maybe like a part-time weekend. So again, you have school from nine, to, uh, from eight to four, you have uh, even a reporting center from four to eight, and on weekends you have a transitional job program that's getting some money in your pocket, I think is all important. Again, a lot of these strategies would have to partner with whatever probation is doing, whatever local law enforcement is doing, um, uh, you know, just to be more effective. This isn't the one all be all. Um, it, it's meant to complement um, our folks who are on the ground uh, doing a lot of the work in terms of the enforcement side. Um, and then again, right, coming up with, with our document of 
and I just made up a name, you know, but our roadmap to reducing uh, delinquency and recidivism here in the county, right? It's pretty much a document that outlines everything we did here in the county, what the data was, what our plan is to improve, what our overall goals are, uh, um, and we can call it a five-year plan, a six-year plan, whatever it is, um, just informing the community what, it, what, all, what all we are working toward. <clears throat> And this is hard to see if, if you all didn't receive an agenda uh, that's attached, but just kind of talking about um, anybody who doesn't have uh, a logic model. It's on the page two or three of what we attach. But just kind of, you know, as we're developing the structure of our department here, uh, kind of talking about what, what all, you know, we aim to do. So I, I started with the methodology of, of, of the department. <coughs> And it's just the belief that intensive supervision plus intensive support is going to equal a reduction of resistance to behavioral change and a decrease in antisocial behaviors for young people here in the county. Some of the strategies that I'm hoping to use is focus on high-risk youth, identify who they are, and then provide service to them uh, um, um, and you know, work with our partners to make sure that they're supervised uh, or make, you know, make sure that there's an intensive supervision with that piece. Again, focus on the areas that are most needed. Talking about a public health approach, not that we're going to exclude any municipality here in the county, but um, you know, focus on the affected area, that, in the, mo the area that's affected the most. If we can have a reduction there, essentially, we can, have, we can have it anywhere. Earlier, I was told about a program that the DA was working on, and they started off in the city of Chester. It shows some promise and they're expanding to other areas. I think we have to take the same approach. Uh, if the data shows us that Chester is, is, is the most uh, needed uh, program. So focus on highest, highest risk youth, highest risk areas, and making sure we're aligning our, program, aligning our programs, right? A holistic approach, not just servicing the young people, servicing their families, servicing their peers, servicing their community. Um, and then make sure that we're, you know, we're really dove into evidence-based practices. Um, Applying a learning approach. Again, I've talked about the inclusive process. Make sure there's a system in which we're constantly reflecting on what we're doing and making sure there's room to improve in any areas that, that aren't working. And then, again, uh, partnership. Community-based organizations, uh, criminal justice agencies, and neighborhood leaders all at the table uh, with this strategy. So with the three pieces, you have focus on high-risk youth, high-risk areas, uh, evidence-based practices, one output that we, we hope to gain with that is uh, we're making sure that we're using a data a data informed process, right? We're making data informed decisions. Um, in terms of making sure we're applying a learning approach, we're building an equitable evaluation model uh, with all partners at the county with, um, here at the table, uh, and then make you know having community uh, criminal justice agencies and neighborhood leaders at the table, just making sure that we're distributing our resources properly. We talk about short-term short outcomes. Obviously, we want to develop what this menu of services is. So we want to build program capacity, uh, promote effective programs, and create new um, that align with the needs of the county. Um, and again, we want to continue to empower community leadership. Um, I'm big on that uh, just because, you know, folks sitting in these seats, uh, depending on where they are in their careers, may move on. Um, one thing for, for sure is the community is going to remain. Making sure that their leadership, uh, their organizations are included in this process uh, is big. Um, the city of Oakland had created a community organization, a community-based uh, advisory board that lasted pretty much through every mayor in Oakland. Um, and as leadership changed, they were still there and they're still invested. We don't want to develop this comprehensive strategy and, you know, Councilman Madden goes on to be state senator and everybody is not here what? anymore. And at that point, uh, it's no lost. <laughs> not, not that he has. Uh, gets out of the bag. For the record, not that he has any plans for that. Just, uh, we just want to make sure that community is invested at that point. They can ultimately lead the strategy when we're all here and going. I've, I've, I always joke and say I'm here for a, a, a good time, not a long time. Uh, and then, you know, I think with the intermediate outcomes, and I think this is where we have to have uh, our measurable goals with our yearly, right? We, if we want a percentage decrease uh, for rates of delinquency, a percentage decrease of uh, juvenile recidivism,
that's pretty much a standard that the board is holding me to, right? Now, the vehicles we use in order to accomplish these things are going to vary, uh, different programmings, uh, you know, et cetera. Um, but again, let's say collectively we're saying by uh, 2028 we want to reduce the population of, uh, of our center. We want to reduce the population of young people who recidivate and are arrested by 50%. That stage one is hopefully going to provide some of that data, and then we can essentially divide it by then. So we can say a 10% decrease year one, 10% uh, decrease in a prior year, year two, uh, and then we talk about our long-term outcomes, right? Ultimately, you know, we're just talking about neighborhood, the, the change of culture in the neighborhood, right? And we can measure that by um, uh, neighborhood survey, whatever. Uh, but, you know, just pretty much based off of five years of doing X, Y, and Z, uh, the perception of the neighborhood have changed, right? They believe that young people, young people believe that there actually are services uh, in place in order for them to succeed. Uh, the community believes that the county is here supporting them. They are heard, things of that nature. Uh, and we talk about our overall impact. And I just, I just listed something, you know, really want to build a safer community by improving uh, the quality of life of criminal justice involved youth and their families. Ms. Marie. Yeah, so mm -hmm. um, the intermediate outcomes, what really jumped out at me is that it's, it's, I mean, I think obviously we want these two things, but a decrease in the rates of juvenile delinquency only tells me as a community member that fewer young people were arrested and adjudicated delinquent. Sure. It doesn't tell me that Delaware County's young people are thriving. Sure. Um, Likewise, recidivism. So I wondered if we could also consider some positive intermediate outcomes. Sure. More young people engaged with school, job training, after school activities, well, uh, um, to, mental and behavioral health if they need yeah. it. I mean, to counter that, that would be, those will be listed as the vehicles we use in order to get there, right? So any program that we invest in, they're going to have to have measured outcomes, right? So we yeah. invest in the after school, or we invest in a mental health program or some of these strategies you talked about, right? They have a yearly uh, criteria in terms of their outcome, whether they have to service X amount of youth. Um, some of the things you talked about, I look at more in terms of a vehicle that you use in order to accomplish a goal. Um, yeah, you can say, yes, you can say delinquency doesn't show, um, but again, if, if we have the data support that at some point in time, X amount of young people were arrested, um, you know, based off of certain actions, whether we got hundred in, in a job readiness program, a hundred one-on-one mentors, things of that nature. Uh, what, you know, it, it's directly connected to the lack of them having police contact and being arrested. And that's, that's kind of my way of thinking. I agree, but, but here's why I think it's connected to our juvenile justice system. Delaware County currently diverts less than any other county in the Commonwealth. Sure. Any other. Which is positive. And, and and the reason for that, I think, is that the juvenile justice system does not integrate these other services to some degree, right? Because if, if, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Sure. If you've got behavioral health integrated with your juvenile justice system, then you're not just thinking about delinquency as an outcome. You're thinking about a referral to a behavioral health agency as an outcome. So I think it's both, but, but I think it's important to sort of call it out here. Yeah because it reminds us that it's a part of our charge as well. It's not just the charge of the behavioral health system to find the kid who might be delinquent. It's a part of the delinquency system's charge to find behavioral health services for the kid who might need it, who might not otherwise be delinquent, but for sure. that service. Yeah, and, and I, Woods, I think your, your comments really point to the fact that this department uh, can and won't be working in a vacuum that our newly formed public health department should be in constant communication with what's going on in the detention department um, right. and you know what's going on with the DCIU. So we have other stakeholders that are more you know, directly aligned to these sort of positive outcomes that you're, you're speaking of. Yeah. Um, so you know, I, I, I wouldn't sort of look at what Dave's intermediate you know, measurements are that probably more directly line out under detention so to speak, as being exclusive of the more public health related I hope uh, not. outcomes. Yeah. Can, can, I, can I just add one sure. additional thing? Um, as I was listening to you, um, and what stuck out to me, like jumped out really big, is education. 
And, um, and I circled that because when we look at the communities that we're serving, uh, or th that we're assuming, I'm not going to say that we know for sure, but once you get the data, you'll know for sure, that those communities more than likely historically are, have, have a lesser quality education. Agreed. Right? And so, and so they are struggling themselves. And so their ability to support young people, um, even through the detention program, is, is very hard to do. So for instance, in the city of Chester, uh, one of the programs they used to have is Youth Bill. That program no longer exists. Youth sure. Bill was the juvenile, was a, was a place where young people went to get um, support, and they started getting involved in trades, et cetera, et cetera. That doesn't exist. And so without, unless someone is putting that back in place, it becomes hard for them to deal with their regular challenges and things like that. So a suggestion that I, that I just wrote down here was that, um, and whether it's from your office or it's the, act, the, the county commissioners who do this, but my suggestion is that we maybe look at putting together a task force around education to support the young people that you're talking about. Because if we do this countywide, Right, uh, whether you're in Chester or you're in Upper Darby or you're in Yaden or you're in Falkroft, um, you're going to need that support. And so, the support, and especially in again a community, if I'm going to use Chester as an example, um, the issue is not um, juvenile um, probation or anything else. The issue is economic development. It's jobs. Sure. There's there's no jobs, right? And so the lack of jobs, not that the county has to be the supplier of all these things, but if there's if jobs and business development or entrepreneurship isn't looked at, and the support for family, as you mentioned, is not looked at, then you're basically sending a young person back to the same system that they came out of, and they're not going to, they're not going to receive the services that they need. So my suggestion, only because we had something like this once before, was um, we, um, and this was for a different reason, but we had um, a, a college access center. So the college access center's its purpose was for every young person in Delaware County to have the ability to come and learn about college. We're not talking about college here, so but we are talking about career and technical uh, programs, right? So getting the, the IU, uh, whoever does the CTE programs sure. in the county, maybe the community college and the trades sure. together and bring them together and say, okay, if we have young people that need intervention, what can you do, what can you provide into these programs to help us do what we need to do? Right. So that when you're in stage one and a half, right, after you get into the data and everything else, sure. you're already making the interventions that are necessary to prove the outcomes that you talked about here. I agree. Okay. So. I'm sorry. Sure. Ms. Townsend. Um, I, I appreciate the last comment and wanted to add that I think that the workforce board um, in terms of options for employment services, especially to this population, could be um, an interesting partner. And I believe they did come and speak to us or they wanted to come and speak to us. So as you're thinking about um, I, I didn't catch the name of the person who was speaking before me, but I think the workforce board and also the community college, the, you know, Delaware Community College, um, are two places that we might want to think about how we are building or, or bringing them along with the data collection process, but if they're not within their assets as well. I agree. And uh, for the record, that was Mr. James Turner who uh, spoke before me. But yeah, I, I hear you loud and clear. I just wanted to add in that that would be, I do believe that the Workforce Development Board would love to come and meet sure. with this group. Um, and we just received back data from, like, just right in line with this from our out of school youth and are in the phase of trying to develop programming to yep. help address that group and making sure that they are in the pipeline for workforce development and moving into career pathways. So I, I met with the Office of Workforce Development. Um, program they have geared toward young people who are involved in the system. I'm meeting with them, uh, I believe, next week. So we're already engaged in those conversations, um, and uh, I think they'll be a positive partner for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just make the comment that um, 
I, I do have some concerns over the overlap of our existing programs mm -hmm. um, and the people that are ahead of us on some of these things like the workforce development. Also the public health department, if we're looking at this as a health crisis and violence as a health problem, I, I assume that we can get help there. I also am wondering regarding the county's plans for a criminal justice leader to be um, engaged by council or for the executive director, what role. So I see us as part of that, but I don't see us, I'll be candid, I don't see us as driving the entire um, juvenile justice reform movement. We have some targeted responsibilities. And um, so I really appreciate the plan. I think we'll all fit in and there's room for a lot of, there's room for improvement everywhere. Sure. Um, but I would, I would, hope that we will be able to come back to a targeted approach as we move forward with the greater plans and as we integrate with the other programs if, for human services. If you sit through a council meeting and see all the providers that we have doing different aspects of all these things, um, you know, it will be good to have that consolidated. But um, I, do, I do hope from my, my view is that I will try and stay targeted on at least some of the primary responsibilities that I think we have, which is housing. So the stage four being immediate responsibility, sure. I think that's, I, I would like us to be keeping that at the forefront while we move on these other aspects as well. Yeah, and I think your comments really speak again to the fact that this board and, and, and Mr. Rosari can't be working in a vacuum, that there is certainly overlapping um, you know, concerns between, you know, looking at it through the lens of, of, of detention and looking at it from a public health perspective, looking at things from a workforce development perspective, from the intermediate unit. You know, these are departments that all have <coughs> interrelated concerns. Um, I'll leave it at that. Mm -hmm. Great. Any other questions? Okay. So, We don't hear anything I'm talking about today. Uh, number one, Sean, I think of, is I need some help. <laughs> I don't hear anything else today, right? Everything else preliminary, but I need some help. So I talked about, uh, I guess, in uh, the preliminary stages, uh, some key positions I would like to bring aboard. Number one, so, so somewhat of a deputy administrator, deputy director, if you want to call it. Um, I, sent, I sent the board these job descriptions prior, but essentially uh, focusing on a lot of the administrative tasks as it relates to finances, the grants, contracts, things of that nature. Pretty much, uh, um, and at times I, I'm, I'm unable to attend here, be able to fill in and act, and act in my role. <clears throat> I think one key position that is a game changer um, I held a very similar position in my start in city government is this director field operations piece, right? So as, we, as we're investing in different programs, if we're, as we're getting uh, continuing contracts with existing programs, as we are placing young people throughout the Commonwealth, uh, somebody who works on the ground, uh, it's one thing to send over a piece of paper, report and say, you know, <clears throat> we're servicing this many young people or this how many people are regularly attending. But having somebody who um, is providing those real-time assessments on a random Tuesday popping in the center, on a random Tuesday popping on a community-based organization that we're funding, and really giving uh, a comprehensive assessment of, of, of what they're seeing throughout that day, I think um, you know um, keeps keeps contractors on their toes, but also pr provides us with real-time information that I, that I think is needed. In terms of the residential staff, I think um, it, there's, it's question, right? There's a question now. I think uh, I base a lot of it off of uh, our potential partnership with Chester County and, and what they needed. Um, and again, um, an executive system to kind of uh, help our leadership team um, with a lot of day-to-day -day assume, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of back in a, a gym, gym and he's, he's phenomenal. A lot of stuff that he's done uh, to set this board up and assist this board. Somebody kind of assuming those roles I think is very important. Um, and I think the question of the hours is what, you know, what's a strategy cost us? And this is all preliminary um, and it may be hard to see. I apologize for anybody who can't see it. Um, so you look at the staffing levels. Um, 
In terms of detention staff, a lot of this was based off of what Chester, Chester County recommended. Um, so 15 full-time counselors, uh, five part-time for a total of 20 working in the center. They asked for a case manager. Uh, they only have one case manager in the center, uh, so somebody to compliment there. And then they wanted, I labeled it like a therapeutic staff. They wanted somebody who would be working one-on-one -on -one with young people as they're going through like a crisis. Um, so that position is there. Um, it has uh, what I hope to pay uh, my leadership team. Um, I think the biggest pot of the budget is the contract of services. Um, we don't know what that looks like, but again, when I talk about the strategy, having ready and available funding um, as we see programs and want to pilot them um, is big. Um, Howard assisted me a bit, in, a bit in terms of what rental space uh, in Chester County uh, can potentially cost. Again, these are all numbers that we do not have exact, exact numbers on. Um, there's a $30,000 piece in here, and there's, there's an existing Lima, uh, Lima Detention Center where we have to uh, essentially uh, clean out, right? At least one aspect of it where there's being a rebuild of mm -hmm. a, a central assessment center for, uh, for, for, for folks. Um, so again, we, we did a guesstimation on what that can cost. Uh, we'll talk about that process later on in the budget. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's a deficit here, but again, as we, as there's a, a deficit of uh, over 300,000, but as we, as we uh, talk about partnering with organizations like Workforce Development, and, you know, they told me that, you know, uh, you know there, there's a potential there in terms of uh, helping us out with funding and things of that nature. So uh, we can offset some of these costs. And again, this is a guesstimation. I just think wherever we come with, a big, the biggest pot uh, has to come with, uh, has to be available for community-based organizations as we want to uh, develop and, and implement new strategies in, in areas that are, that are most most at need. You know, whoever the evaluator is or the research um, uh, contractor who's going to help out with the strategy falls within that piece as well. Again, all preliminary stuff, just want to kind of give folks uh, something to go off. Any, any, any questions in terms of the staffing and, and uh, the price tag? Yeah, so sorry, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I was just going to question the number of detention counselors. Yep. Given that, and, and probably, I feel like you almost answered this question, but sure. um, given that the average daily census is what it is, what are the assumptions that have you arriving at 15 full-time detention counselors? Right, so we talk about the ratio. Uh, it's essentially two, uh, two to six during the day, and I think uh, maybe one to eight for the overnight shift. Uh, so if we had 12 beds, uh, essentially we would need maybe 11 uh, full-time staff. But again, uh, we were really focusing on what Chester County needed. Um, they, told oh, so us, they, they told us 20, 15 full-time, five part-time. Um, again, if our long-term plans are to develop something new, having as much folks trained that we're going to transition over is a win for us. Um, our pod if in Chester County being overstaffed is a win for us uh, because essentially the call-outs and things and, you know, we're, 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 we're in a uh, pandemic, uh, you know, folks can be sick, and I think having enough staff that folks can just step right in and um, there's, there's never going to be an issue in terms of there isn't any space or... Uh, there is enough staff to, to uh, man our pot. Okay, yep. thank you. That sounds really well thought out. Um, the, the salary levels are based on what? I mean, these are the people arguably doing the toughest job, right? Sure. So, so is this a living and sustainable wage for that work? I mean, that's arguable, right? I think, um, I think one positive is if we agree upon this pay scale, it's, it's more than what they were making before, not that you know, it makes it right or not. Um, uh, if we look at, I think nationally, uh, living wage is $15 an hour, right? And may, that oh, may be changing. At one point it was $15 an hour. Nobody uh, killed me for that one. But um, again, you know, we, we looked at um, what our county's uh, correctional officers were making. We really, we wanted to compare it to that and, and have it aligned with that piece. Um, I'll never be a, against paying for folks more. Um, but again, we wanted to start somewhere. And also, I think we have to kind of change, uh, you know, and I sent you all the job, job description in terms of my vision. I, I really would like to get a lot more uh, combination of maybe some folks who are, are seasoned, but 
a lot more younger folks who may just have graduated college, um, who have, uh, you know, who have aspirations to be in a, a role in criminal justice, right? I don't want this to be a position where folks take it, you know, 20 years go by, right? Really kind of just a feeder system. Right? I started my criminal justice career at Delaware County's Detention Center um, and have, you know, sitting in these seats as a controller or, or as a judge. Uh, so, you know, I think coming out of college, if I was making $20 more an hour, I would be ecstatic, but, you know, I don't want to speak for all young people. I would just comment that I guess all those, these numbers would have to be in context of everything else that's going on in the county, at the at, at George W. Hill, um, our park police, our, you know, there's a, there's a, a lot to take into consideration. And um, so I think that that's something that council would be interested in. And, um, you know, there are also benefits and all. So I, I, what I was going to say is that I, I did take a look at that and I would be, you know, I'd be interested in hearing further discussions with you as sure. to how you arrived at that and with the budget already set right now for this year, um, you know, just to project where, where we're going to be. And it, it would all depend on what, what we've accomplished in a, in a short term and what you needed. So no, I understand you loud and clear, Joanne. I, I know you're the key. You're the key here. We'll get, we'll, we'll get you on board. I understand. <laughs> um, I want to, is there another? Go ahead. Shakima has a question. Thank you, um, Elaine. I have I have a question about I'm going back to uh, where the 15 detention council with the census um, being that, that it is. What would people be doing when when the numbers are low? Is this like a variable? Like you want to have up to 15, but they might not always be like have hours of employment. I'm trying to I'm having a hard time reconciling the work when the census is as low as it is. What are they doing? Are they gonna be focused on follow-up, support? I, I'm just, I'm struggling with that number given what we've been seeing with the data. Well, I, I will say, Ms. Townsend, again, to, to be within ratio, can folks hear me? To be within ratio, uh, you essentially are gonna need two staff members in that pod. This plan essentially gives you one more, one more individual who's in the pod at that time. Um, you know, we can be as creative as possible in what we, what we want them doing. Uh, but again, it's, it's just, you know, my vision is three well trained individuals who are interacting with young people, provides more time for one-on-ones. Uh, we, we, can, we can be creative, right? But uh, I'm with you, you know, folks aren't just gonna be sitting around uh, playing uh, puzzle, you know, uh, board games, uh, unless they're playing with young people. So uh, yeah, I understand, but you know, essentially in retrospect, it's just one more guy in the room. So to be clear, 15 is not 15 people working all the time. It's 15 people over. Yeah, you got, you got three, three shifts. People, it's, three, it's three shifts or four shifts? Yeah, it's three <laughs> shifts. You essentially have somebody who's going to have to work weekends. So right, sorry, it's, okay. it's, 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 it seems like a lot of folks, but in retrospect, uh, you know, uh, it, it isn't as much. And it essentially only provides one more person in the room during, uh, per shift. And to put it in context, we had 65, I think, when it was closed or something around there. So it's uh, far smaller than what we were staffing um, when we were closed. Now, I, I had just had a um, kind of high level sort of structural sure. disconnect sure, sure. Uh, with the budget. And that is the way I understand it, the revenue that we use to pay for juvenile detention comes per child who is detained. So if our goal is to reduce detention and not have them detained at all, how are we paying for this? Because then we don't get the revenue for yeah. the de detained. Yeah. Uh, I would defer, uh, you know, I would defer to maybe an expert. I mean, to my knowledge, I believe uh, the state reimburses after, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I guess the census is reported and how much they have per year. Well, again, that's something I have to look into, and I can get okay. back to you, and I, you know, I can talk to the experts and make sure. Uh, you know, I was told that you know the budget this year was around two million, uh, and I tried to base it off of that. You know, working right. with, with Howard. Right. Does anybody know? Am I right? Is that budget dependent upon how many children go through the system, hmm. and it fluctuates? Yeah. Again, I, I would I would have to check in with, okay. with with some of our partners, and I can get back to you with it. That, that seems to me, it sounds yeah. like, let's, let's, yeah. let's keep it the way it is. Yeah, that's We're going to pay cash. for the bodies, 
and what I hear him talking about is in things we're talking about doing is we want to reduce that. Right. And if anything, we should be rewarded if we have fewer children there and we have them more in the community and out of trouble. So I don't know, that may be a battle we have to deal with that the might, state. We, we have to find yeah. funding for not putting yeah, them in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it, may no, be, it may be it's a matter of getting them, if they're in your system, meaning that, okay, so you've identified someone. They don't necessarily have to be physically in the space. They just simply have to be under your services at a particular okay. time. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. So, but that's I don't know. So, yeah. whoever yeah, that's, knows. I don't know. That's actually. A fact. That's correct. I do I believe that's correct. This yeah. is basically it's, the cost. It's not, it's in the it, we, we haven't talked about revenue here, and the cost here is really driven by visible. what gave Chester County comfort in order for us to staff a uh, 24/7 operation, and it really comes down to being prepared to have high-risk youth who are directed into confinement. So I, I mean, if you ask, I freely admit this may not be the best use of resources on a continual basis, but it is a minimum staffing level in order to meet the requirements of the uh, of, of having a facility open and available, uh, not knowing when uh, high-risk young, young people are going to be directed into that facility. Um, Danielle, you, you can talk, if you want to add into the revenue side of it, please do, <coughs> because that budget, um, there, there is reimbursement. I don't know what the formula is. And there's also other monies that the courts get to address um, maintenance of juveniles. And you're probably best able to discuss how that money's used. Um, well, there's a couple of factors. So the rate of reimbursement is based on the level of service. So the higher the rate of reimbursement, the in community services. So if you have a child receiving services in the community, the rate of return is 80-20, generally to be reduced by any other revenues that are received, whether it be grant funding or other provider funding. Um, for detention, the rate of reimbursement is 50%, less any parental maintenance or other revenues that are received, Social Security and other things that when a child enters the facility, probation generally files a complaint with domestic relations for support. That's the parental maintenance. That's calculated through the Office of Domestic Relations. Um, so the 80-20, who's which is 80 which is 20. well that's for kids in the community so all of our in-home services all of the services that are provided by jpo uh, cys and human services are generally reimbursed anywhere from 50 percent or more all the way up to in some cases 95 percent or 100 percent depending on the service mm -hmm. and whether or not block grant dollars are used and you've heard that when sandy garrison comes before council on a number of those uh, initiatives um, for detention, because it's licensed as secure detention, any secure program is only able to be reimbursed at 50%. Mm -hmm. So the and model that's based actually does, model does the support, the support outside mm -hmm. intervention and services. Right, and unfortunately, I think we saw your last report this week, and thank you, because you're always so on top of that, is, I mean, we had, there's two, there was, a, I believe, a homicide and criminal attempt to commit homicide. And so the reality is, you know, it's not going to happen overnight, I and mean, we do need to secure uh, detention center for high-risk individuals. I mean, we're seeing, if, you, if you've noticed, all the reports, there's an uh, increase in how violent the crimes are that, that we're seeing. This is the first time I've seen the homicide and at least criminal homicide. For well, and that's because December 21st, with the federal regulations, <laughs> now if you're charged as an adult, even if you're under the age of 18, you it's are housed in the detention center until an interest of justice hearing occurs. We've had our first such hearing last week. That young man was transferred from the detention center uh, to the jail. Um, it has been that until a motion is filed by the Commonwealth, the individual or he ages, he or she ages, uh, turns 18, will remain in detention. Motion filed, interest of justice hearing, or the individual stays there until they turn 18 and then they automatically transfer to the jail sure. under the direct file. But, but just to clarify, you've only just begun giving us direct files, right? Like, they only started like, after only December started. 21st. No, I'm saying that, that you've, been, you've been showing <laughs> that to the board. Like, oh, got been, it. Yes, in the last few okay. weeks that we... So it's not that there were no direct files before cool. late last year, it's just that the board was not given the report of the direct file. Correct, files because they were not entering a juvenile facility in which I was tracking, to be quite honest. Right. Now that I'm charged at the judge's request to look for beds, <laughs> For those individuals, I'm able to track them because I'm involved from the time of arrest. Got it. Just to wrap up with Mr. Rosari's uh, presentation, any other? 
think that might be it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Mateo. All right, good evening, everybody. As of today's current census, we have six total juveniles in juvenile facilities, and then we have four direct files in juvenile facilities. We have two males and a female out at Chester County, and we have two males. out at Aspire. <clears throat> I will say that just this past Thursday alone, I had five calls for detention on Thursday alone. We were only able to detain two of those individuals. <clears throat> so three of those individuals had to be released back into the community. Two of those three have already been previously released into the community two and three times. And they immediately cut off their GPS monitors within minutes of being released from the police station. <clears throat> With that being said, it is getting harder and harder to find detention beds now that we also have to house direct file juveniles as well. Um, <clears throat> so, does anybody have any questions or comments on the current census? Uh, are you able to give the board uh, a little demographic profile of the five? Like what, what alleged charges were they facing? <clears throat> Uh, I believe it is on the census, but we, they are aged, the youngest is 11 male, and the oldest is 17 year old male. No, I mean, I, I reviewed that. They said you were, there were folks you had to send home. They wouldn't be on that list, correct? Oh, uh, well, I can tell you what they were. Um, <clears throat> two 17 year old males, um, black, non-Hispanic, and <clears throat> we also had to release one juvenile who was being kicked out of a place, a secure placement facility to be no place for him in the community either. He is a white male. Uh, I wasn't necessarily interested in the race, uh, more so the alleged charges. <clears throat> of the two on Thursday that had to be released, they were being charged with burglary, robbery. There was about eight felony counts. <clears throat> eight felony counts and then terroristic threats, harassment, simple assault, Couple, there was like three or four counts of burglary, three or four counts of robbery. Um, I will say that when we had to call the police back and say, you know, we don't have beds for these individuals, I am getting pushback from the police department. They are frustrated as we are as well. Um, we understand their frustration, especially from a victim standpoint when the police officer said to me, I just had victims in here IDing these individuals and now I have to release them back into the community. There are other standpoints that we have to look at and that we are concerned with as well, especially given the fact that some of these individuals now know what they can get away with and are willing to say, hey, you don't even bother putting this on me, I'm just cutting it off. Parents who are frustrated with the system, parents who are frustrated with the police departments, you know, begging for our help and we can't at this point. There's nothing we can do if we can't confine them. <clears throat> So to accept say, our help. I, I would just say that I think you should be assured that everybody on the board shares your frustration. <clears throat> that if there are people in the community who are a danger to the community, we don't want them, uh, you know, in the community. We want them confined if that's what the appropriate uh, intervention is. So I just wanted to underscore that that I don't think there's anyone on this board who thinks that someone who's a danger to the community uh, should be roaming free. And I think so, that serves as a really good segue to the next item, um, because we all share <coughs> the urgency to have secure detention space. Um, but unless there are any other further questions of board. No, there's other options. <laughs> Where are the options? Where are the options? And I guess you're going to talk about that, but. Yep, Mr. Rosario, do you want to? Thank you. Thank you. All right, so next, again, I talked about, you know, number one priority is trying to solidify 
uh, what this uh, short-term um, plan is. Um, and David, if I just mentioned, you know, given the nature of ongoing conversations with Chester County and perhaps others, just be sort of mindful of the degree of detail. Of yeah, no worries, no worries. So we all got together, um, Councilman Maddow, myself, Executive Director uh, Howard Lazarus, when we met with the leadership in uh, Chester County. Um, uh, I guess ongoing conversations around the negotiation, uh, inching toward it. Uh, they committed by um, you know, the end of next week having uh, a draft of potentially what a partnership could look like. Um, and uh, you know, and, uh, you know, I'm reaching out to other agencies as well. Um, again, we're just we're prioritizing this piece and trying to get it done. But I think that's kind of where we are. Uh, after the 23rd, I think we'll have somewhat of a uh, what a plan could be. And I'll only add there, um, you know, unfortunately, really, this is for the first time. But this is involving up to their board of commissioners. The, the chairwoman is involved in the conversations as well. So they have elevated this to the point where it's either going to be proceeded with or it's not. Still 12 bids? Yeah, as of now, one pot, 12 bids. Okay. Is there a draft that's circulating now, no. or there's not even a draft? No. We Can we take the laboring ore in the drafting? Because that's the way you get a document done. Yeah. <laughs> you labored that point, Joanne. <laughs> well, give it to them, because. So, so we asked them to separate this out into two parts. One would be the basic terms and conditions, which is what I think, Joanne, you'd like to look at to get started. And one was an operating agreement. I think the underlying problem beneath that is a little bit more serious. And I actually reached out to Councilmember Madden to get engaged at the policy maker level, if you will, because of um, um, some, we weren't able to do it at the staff and working level. So um, I don't know that I want to go in much beyond no, that, no, but I appreciate to. leadership from, from, from Mr. Madden to get us here, because it is a policy matter at this point to, to do the, um, to make, take advantage of available space, which goes back to the conversation we just had about staffing level. So I, I do think after many false starts and, and thoughts, we're gonna to get to the point where we're either gonna know they're gonna go forward or they're not next week. And David is working on some alternatives as well, uh, both you know plan B, C, and D. And hopefully we'll, we'll be able to get through this and by email and inform you as to where we are pretty shortly. Yeah, I appreciate that. It's just that we've been, it's been, it was December, January, it's February, it'll be March, it'll be a year, mm -hmm. and um, they either need to tell us or not. I, I, that's what it comes down to, and I know you're working on it, but again, in any transaction or deal, they need to tell us, because otherwise, it was, we went on a tour, it's a nice facility, it was pretty empty, there was space. I, if we could put 12 people there as needed, it would be a blessing. Yeah, and it's so, uniquely empty. Yeah, I mean, there aren't yeah. facilities like that around yeah. the state that so, are so I know you're working on it. It's just that um, I, I do express our, my frustration on behalf, and every time I'm reading the paper and I read a uh, 15-year-old in Clifton Heights is, has a robbery spree, I'm wondering where's that child going. Yeah. Um, so I know, I know we're all on the same page on that, but it, but it is urgent. Yeah, just to reiterate, I know Danielle's been working a lot on it. I mean, a lot of the centers I call it throughout the Commonwealth, there's limited space everywhere, right? And there's, there's centers as close as an hour away that are already contracting with 13 different counties. So, you know, this isn't an issue that's, uh, you know, it's an issue that's, that's going on throughout the Commonwealth. And I think it uh, puts us in a very unique situation, but we're working, we're working toward something positive and hopefully we're able to uh, uh, get a win here for the team. Uh, moving on to the next agenda item, I know um, Board Member Phillips uh, want, really wanted to have an update in terms of where we are with uh, essentially uh, you know, the cleanup or the confidential file retention. Um, so again, I'm, I'm meeting with facilities on Thursday. We're coming up with a plan. Um, we're essentially going to move and obviously, you know, of course, label where things come from, everything to the gymnasium. Our facilities uh, department is going to man the labor on that aspect of it. Um, our partners and uh, solicitor team at Archer Law is going to go in with a team of paralegals to pretty much sort through what's what, what confidential, what, what files are what, um, have those labeled, um, and then we are going to bring in a uh, a vendor to uh, uh, 
file retention, whether it's digitize it, whether it's pack them up and store them, um, can't shred anything, you know, as it's still under the investigation of Attorney General's office. Um, so uh, we're hoping that, uh, you know, we'll begin at least the moving process after my meeting with Ed Orner down at uh, facilities uh, and get things moving. Great. Yep. Thank you. Yep. yep. You might want to um, send the health department people to take a look at empty filing cabinets and things after the place is empty because we still need things in other places. Yeah, I mean, what's we'll possible? There are there is things like that can equipment, be like furniture. equipment, furniture. I, some of it's not definitely not going to be good, but filing cabinets and yeah. things like that look possible. Well, I, I I will say most of the filing cabinets uh, were ripped open. Yeah, if it doesn't general, if it doesn't so. cost more money to save them. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. yep. All right, that's all I have. All right. Um, any new business for today? I just have a clarifying question. When uh, we do get a space or something, um, when we mm -hmm. have the opportunity to post for jobs, where would that job posting, where, where would that be for our community members to apply? Does that happen on the county? Is yep. it a It'd be, it'd be a combination of the county website, and they also use Indeed, and I believe one more. Because it'll be three different sites that it'll be posted, and okay. uh, I'll be making folks aware of that as well. Okay. I, I do want to mention we've reached out directly to the displaced um, that's staff what, That's what I was as wondering. Well. <laughs> and, Thanks. And David is working to give them kind of the, the first up. shot at the jobs. Thank you. That's where I was kind of going with we're that. All, I didn't know. They're also, we're also, we've also... Um, had the opportunity to offer different job opportunities to a couple of the Great. impacted staff. So it's foremost on our minds. Thank you. And I will only say that's being done in conjunction with the Attorney General's office. It's sure, great. Yep. In a vacuum. Sure, absolutely. Makes sense. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other new business? All right. Public comment. And again, uh, any members of the public who would like to speak, please keep your comments to five minutes or less and please give your name and address. Hearing none, um, any further board member comment for today? Yes. Uh, after listening to everything, the first thing I did in the uh, agenda here, I think you ought to change it from juvenile detention to juvenile rehabilitation center. I think just that thought changes things. If we have a center, it's not detention, it's rehabilitation. And I say that because I did go to Chester County and there were four youth there, it was a new facility, but I left with a very empty feeling, a very empty feeling about what we were doing and what they were doing for the youth. And I think that things like being trauma-informed, uh, clear expectations of the behavior of staff, getting skills such as motivational interviewing, those kind of things can help with staff on a detention center. I think we ought to think about that as well. And I know Director DiMatteo is very familiar with all of those things and, in fact, uh, make sure that her staff has it. Her staff knows about that. And I think you also have a lot of contacts in the state, um, at the state level. And I'm sure you probably reached out to them that they can help us as well as we move forward. So I think knowing that and knowing things like the developmental differences in the youth, being sensitive to diversity culture, things like that, will be helpful for us as we move forward. That's all. Yeah, look, I, I wholeheartedly uh, uh, applaud the sentiments. I, I think. The Juvenile Attention Board of Managers is the name that's sort of statutorily given to this body uh, from the state. Um, but, but we can have an AKA. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would, uh, I'm with you on the... Uh, yeah. Okay, AKA. <laughs> okay. Any other comments from the board? All right, hearing none, uh, unless anything else, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Second, second. second and third. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much.